Hello, before getting into the episode today, which features my good friend Jeremy Greer, in which we have a really fun discussion about Souls and Elden Ring, um, I wanted to plug that I am running a fundraiser for Able Gamers Charity. And there is links in the description below, and you can uh, donate or check out the campaign page from there, but it's a really good cause, and I'm seeing how much the Elden Ring community can give back to the wider gaming community, and uh, so far, we are doing really great. At the time of recording, we have about $510 raised in the first day, which is awesome, and um, I hope to keep uh, building that number up. So, um, if you want to donate, you can at those links below, and I wanted to give a quick shout out to some people who have already donated. Uh, you could donate if you have the availability, like Sam, Mike, Souls at Zero, John S., Carson1315, Don't Give Up Elden Ring, Miko Saarinen, a big thanks to Christopher Urquhart, Daniel, and then there is quite a few anonymous tragic things who donated. So thanks for your donations, and I can't wait to see how the Elden Ring community can come together for a good cause. Enjoy the episode. Why hello there, today is day 646 of watching an Elden Ring trailer, and today I have a very special guest joining me. He's done, I think, about a million different podcasts. He used to run the Dark Souls <laughs> Haters blog, which I'm sure he's happy for me to bring up, and uh, oh, Lord. you know, and now he's, uh, he's invested in Hunks and X-Men, which may be the same thing depending on what you're talking about, but I am joined by my good friend uh, Jeremy Greer. Thanks for coming on, Jeremy. Hey, thanks for having me, man. This is this is nice to be here. I like the smell of the Elden Ring joint that you've created. Doesn't <laughs> six hundred something days? It doesn't smell that bad. It's pretty impressive on your part. I like the, like the cleanliness of this whole environment. Yeah, you know, you think it'd be worse. And so I want to. So I'm going to derail us just immediately. This has been something that's been in my head because <laughs> okay. we've been going back and forth, um, trying to schedule this. And since I first uh, started scheduling with you, I had a cursed sentence pop up in my head. And so for those of you who don't know, uh, Jeremy uh, used to, and still occasionally does the don't give up skeleton podcast where he talks to people about their souls experience. And so when I was having you on today, I was like, Oh, we're just going to kind of talk about what we're doing. And then I had the phrase pop into my head. I'm kind of giving Jeremy the reverse skeleton. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been stuck in my head for weeks and I decided I'm just going to leave it until we talk. But I had this like whole, and I told my wife and she was like, that's stupid. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and I was like, I like, the I like it though, dude. I like the reverse skeleton. I got, I, I could actually pitch that as a podcast and have all of my <laughs> old guests interview me. And so every <laughs> single week, it would just be me telling the same stories every <laughs> single time. Like, yeah. Instead of 300 different thing. stories, it's, it's kind of what I do, which is, you know, 600 of the same story. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You get, you get, those yeah, this is a, I, I like, I like this. I like what you're doing though. Like this is a, <laughs> this, this is a nice like niche for completely, like it feels like the epitome of in, the insane souls fandom and where we're at right now, just so hungry and desperate for information. But, yeah. but at the same time, you're such a likable and like relaxed guy that it doesn't have like that weird, like hype YouTube like film all over it. Like you're very excited and you're very interested and you're out there reaching for it and you're trying to grab everything you possibly can, but it doesn't feel like, I don't know, like filmy is the word that comes to mind, like scummy, like it doesn't have like a film of grease all over it. So this feels very relaxed and very cool. Like I, I liked what, what you have what you have created with this Elden Ring trailer situation. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I started it as a parody of like a trailer reaction. Cause the idea of doing a, 600 day old trailer reaction is kind of funny and then just kept doing it because that's that seems to be the thing with Elden Ring right people do the same thing every day because reasons I guess my my friend Mordecai does the daily Elden Ring news where he talks for precisely 19 to 20 seconds to say that there's no news today and uh <laughs> and he, he's getting like 10k views a day so people are hungry for Elden Ring and I'm I thought what if I what if I uh you know because you you get because we've We've been we've been friends in the Souls community for a long time. I was just thinking back on this. It's been about we we started talking around Dark Souls too. It's been about seven years now. Isn't that just, crazy? It's just like isn't that uh, insanity? It it makes me like I've been listening back to Bonfireside Chat during the Dark Souls two season I started there, and 
it's a real trip down memory lane. And I'm just like, it's so funny to hear. It's so much optimism <laughs> in, in their voices <laughs> and just sort of like, cause then I'll go back and forth between bonfire side chat, listening to that. And then I'll listen to them now. And um, I love what they're doing now on duckfeed.tv. Bonfire side chats, one of my like all time favorite souls content things, if not my, my favorite, honestly. And, but you know, it's so funny to just fast forward seven years all of a sudden and just hear the difference. Cause you know, the, the souls games have had a tremendous impact on my life, but it is very funny to just hear during dark souls Two how excited everyone was and just have that excitement kind of give way to whatever we're working with now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting that you say that, that the souls, the soul series as a as, as games have had such a massive impact on your life because like those early bonfire side chat seasons that was my first podcast yeah um <laughs> dark souls was the reason that i ever like that was the first thing that i ever put up on like the internet yeah. right like <laughs> my first my first youtube video was me recording my tv off of my phone because me and like three other people in the Ulusil township like started shield bashing one another <laughs> and I was just cackling laughing. I thought that was yeah. the funniest thing I'd ever seen in my life. And like I know people are out there on YouTube going like that's really the funniest thing you've ever seen. But like dude it was it was like 2011, okay? The game had just <laughs> come out. It was I was cackling. Yeah. Um I guess if it's the Ulusil township the game had been out for a little while, but you know you understand what I'm saying. Oh yeah. Um it's been a while. But that gave me the bug like uploading uploading stuff and uh doing Dark Souls PVP videos. Mm -hmm. annoying the bonfire side chat bros to the point where they just were like, fine, just come on. We'll do a PVP podcast since we keep <laughs> getting stuff wrong and you can be on it. That got <laughs> yeah. me addicted to podcasting, which has been one of the joys of my life. Like I, I have absolutely fallen in love with the you know, concept of talking into a microphone and having people tell me that they like to hear that. That's which yeah. is amazing. <laughs> yeah. So like it's, it's, I have a huge thank you to the bonfire side chat boys, not only for making like extremely excellent, you know, art, extremely excellent content, but also like changing my life just by yeah. asking me to be on a podcast. So, yeah. And that, that that's, it's funny, like looking back and just thinking back on there because it was bonfire side chat and twin humanities talking about souls that got me into the games fully because I gave up on dark souls one, like so many people have that like first non-starter experience. And it was specifically with dark souls two coming out and looking for podcasts to listen to because I, at that time I was really into board game podcasts because I still had time to play board games. And, um, I, <laughs> and I was like, okay, well this, this game's coming out. I'm about to have my first kid, which is a real trip thinking about being in that position. And, um, I want to get back into dark souls. Cause apparently that's a good idea right before you have a kid. And, um, so I was, <laughs> yeah. So I found bonfire side chat, bonfire side chat, and then twin humanities. I think they were guests on there somehow you know mm -hmm. i found them and then i was just i learned that there's this whole other side and it's through them that i found like vadi and epic name bro and learned about the lore which obviously became sort of my primary motivation to beat the games it was the thing that sort of typically moves me along in the games but yeah it's 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 so funny looking back there just because whew, it's it's been it's been a while and even even listening to the episodes that I did on don't give up skeleton. I'm like, who is this person? It's been so long. <laughs> I, know. I just looked it up. You were, I'd forgotten you were episode number two yeah. of don't give up skeleton back in May of 2016. So almost like five years ago now. Yeah. And, I've, and I knew you for a while before that, you yeah. know, talking about that community, talking about finding bonfire side chat and then, uh, you know, discovering twin humanities. I think that's around the time if I wasn't already on Twitter, but that's the time I started becoming a little bit more active on Twitter and finding, and just, it was just all guest of shows. Like, I feel like we all, like, <clears throat> people that you've had on this podcast, or excuse me, this YouTube series, like, I'm going to call it a podcast 87 <laughs> times YouTube. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> what it is. I'm talking into a microphone. This is basically uh, a podcast. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's a, it's a podcast with, like, Elden Ring. Like, play an Elden Ring. Put that, like, redheaded chick up and, and, and show that over and over while I'm talking. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but finding, like, the community and... Uh, before that, I was running Dark Souls Haters, which was awful. Like, it was just <laughs> the worst examples. And I kind of even, I don't even want to plug it. Like, it's still up, but like, I, I kind of, I have this weird compulsion to take it down sometimes, but I just yeah. let it live on. But it was collecting the worst of the worst. Like, it was the worst parts of the community saying the worst possible things. And I was collecting those and putting them out there for people to laugh at. Um, and finding this other side of it, finding 
Gary and Cole and CJ and Patty. Um, and, and these are people like Gary has been to my house. <laughs> Me and Patty <laughs> were playing video games today, yeah. like talking about his kid. Like, we know what I'm saying? Like these, these, have, mm-hmm. these have become my friends for life. Yeah. I was introduced to Chris through Twitter Humanities. Chris is like my podcast co-host and also one of my best friends. Like it's insanity. Like yeah. a lot of my like close, like tight knit family I would consider has come from just happening to pick up Dark Souls in 2011 because Vinnie Caravella and Giant Bomb said it was better than Demon Souls. <laughs> like that was that was it. That was the reason. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's yes yeah, it's, it's funny. And I wanted to make sure because every time you had Patty on something, you guys ended up talking about me for a few minutes. I was like, I have to make sure I find a way <laughs> to bring up Patty. And I saw just today you you guys were once again bashing bashing on lore saying oh I, i'm into lore and i'm like it's it's always the thing on don't give up self and it's like okay lore sucks except for the lore hunter and i'm like yeah, yeah you know <laughs> but we were it's funny because we we were bashing on lore on twitter uh just because we were surprised by the little co-op game called we were here um it it started out as just like a real basic like oh this is a puzzle game like mm-hmm. one person has the clues the other person has the puzzle you have to work out this language to talk to one another um and they've released three of those on playstation like right one after the other um, okay. and so we've played all three of them within a month <laughs> and it went from that to like oh my god like is that the jester is the jester the one oh, is that the princess <laughs> like we were crazy about it and so we, as we were playing the game we're getting this huge final cut scene me and him are both quiet on the microphone and patty if you're listening to this you know this is true we're quiet patty even wanted to re-watch one of the cutscenes at one point that was how like he was how much he was into this and we both said like we need a lore video of this actually we just need the lore hunter to do a video on this we got to gift him this game <laughs> yeah yeah that that is that is that is awesome because from a dark souls perspective i you know i am also at a point where I'm very excited for lore again, hopefully. And, uh, you know, sort of, sort of is a uh, segue into that. So given your long history with it, how are, how are you feeling about Elden Ring at this point? How have you followed it too closely or have you just sort of followed the big releases? Like someone living their lives tends to do. I mean, I've I followed it like a From Software fan, which yeah. is um, I think I think we fall into a couple of different categories. I think there's the the people that are like, I am on blackout as soon as I hear the title, and I don't mm-hmm. ever want to see a single thing. Um, Gary is fond of saying like, we only get our, you know one first go at these things. Why would you want to ruin that? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's people that I fall into the category of people that I fall into, which is like, hey, I want to watch the first trailer. I want to watch like I want to see some gameplay. And then I want to go on full blackout. Like yeah. I don't want to see anything past that because I want to experience it myself. And then there's like that third tier, crazy people like you that are like, mm-hmm. I want to find every single scrap of information so that I can have it beforehand and even compare yeah. it to like what comes later, which is always super interesting. And I love that stuff from retrospect, right? Like once I finish mm-hmm. Elden Ring, excuse me, <clears throat> snip that out. Once I finish Elden Ring, I'm going to go back to your YouTube series where you're comparing these like leaked trailers to the finished product, and I'm going to have yeah. a lot of fun looking at that stuff, right? Um, so I've watched, I've watched the trailer, I've watched the leaked trailer, I've, um, I have a, I follow a bunch of artists on <laughs> Twitter, so I've seen a bunch of Elden Ring fan art. Yeah, <laughs> I of course have read all of the interviews with Miyazaki and the stuff that's George R., with George R. R. Martin. I, uh, I'm really, it's really weird to me how the souls community has responded to the George R. R. Martin stuff, because mm-hmm. I feel like at the same time they are jumping to the conclusion that he's writing like lore descriptions or like item descriptions. Um, yeah. And also at the same time that he's the reason that the game is delayed, yeah. which, is, which is hilarious to me because like, nah, bro, it's COVID times. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like it's a Japanese student COVID times. Y'all. Yeah. <laughs> George R. R. Martin has nothing to do with this anymore. I promise you. Yeah. Um, but like for me, as a fan of George R. R. Martin, uh, who started reading the books like way back when, chewed through them, and, and went on to his other like Game of Thrones, non Game of Thrones stuff. Like I feel like he has a lot of really interesting world building techniques, mm-hmm. and I am super excited to hear that he's like developed this world and they are playing in it. Mm-hmm. Like they are pulling stuff from the lore. I think that's the most exciting that I have been about quote unquote lore in a from yeah. software game in a while Sekiro kind of left me cold like i i think it was I th- this is probably like very western civilization like focused and mm-hmm. I, 
like but i just like it just didn't resonate with me i loved the areas i yeah. loved i loved that game i loved it to pieces but i just like the actual like story kind of was like okay cool like yeah I, I don't know like grandpa came out again it's row like okay sure let's do it <laughs> whatever man um and i never bothered to go look up anything past that right yeah um Bloodborne, I am I'm so immersed into the lore of Bloodborne. I just love yep. it so much. Like I I just want to know more and more and more all the time. Yep. Um but you couldn't pay me enough money to like get on this podcast if we were talking about Dark Souls 4 right now. Yeah. Just could not care less. Like if you told me there was the sun and and, and, and we all know like from software talks about themes, they refer to themselves constantly. Mm-hmm. There's always going to be like trees or giants or the concept of immortality or cycles and death and, re- and rebirth and all these things. But like if it was literally Dark Souls 4 and that was the announced big thing that we were waiting for, I just, I, I just wouldn't care as much to be honest mm-hmm. with you. Like I just would not. But something about Elden Ring, this new world, having this like completely different lore background from George R. R. Martin working with one of my favorite game designers, <laughs> Nidia Misaki. Like combining those two I think is really fascinating. I'm super curious to see what they come up with. Especially because now I'm seeing like these leaked parts of the game and thinking like this looks like Dark Souls 4, right? Like this <laughs> looks a lot like Dark Souls 4. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it is interesting and this is pure speculation um from the mouths of you know mad people who've spent far too long thinking about these things but with bandai namco doing it and then you know over the development of dark souls 3 it went from like this is the end of the series to like this is a turning point the sort of the classic like you know reason why dark souls 3 changed or why the story became so weird and disjointed feeling at least that's what people throw out there is like the the wonder if if from software was like, we don't want to do more dark souls right now, but we want to do a thing. And so like Elden ring is kind of their compromise almost in the sense of like, they're going to do more of the dark souls thing that, that Bandai Namco wants, but they're sort of doing it on their terms. So it's not going to be entrenched in that same world. They have George R. R. Martin on, which, you know, that that's the X factor that could totally blow this theory out of the water. Like if I got the chance to work with George R. R. Martin, why wouldn't I jump on that? You know, and I could see that being the opportunity that sort of sparked it. But it is interesting seeing the game plan. As we know, that gameplay could be a year. It could be two years. It could be older than that. It's hard to tell because it was never supposed to come out. But um, it does look very Dark Souls. And on the one hand, what do you expect out of like a uh, action RPG in that same engine? covering (laughs) fantasy it's like it's always going to look a little bit the same just because of the engine i'm thinking but like it it is interesting to see and ultimately find out how different from dark souls it actually is and i'm kind of thinking you know at least at least from like a world perspective is george r R. martin alone is going to really change things up in probably a positive way just that like he's that source book he's that world building and that way like I love from software and the way they tell stories, but it it would be hard pressed to convince me that like no one could form a, maybe a more cohesive mythology for them to work off of. And that's not really a shot at from software. That's just like, like talent sets. And the fact that, and the fact that like, I I kind of, and it might be, it's, I kind of, it may be a dumb explanation, but I've always like go to this like sort of like twin peaks <laughs> metaphor because apparently I'm a parody of myself and um, it sort of feels like, you know, like George R. R. Martin gets to be like the Mark Frost who gets to work out how the world works and all the little details and all the political factions and all that like nitty gritty stuff. And then from software gets to do the Lynch thing where they're like, we're going to throw out some beautiful images and you're not going to be totally sure what's happening, but trust me, there's a story behind this somewhere. Sure. Yeah. Like, so. and I think that's, like that connective tissue part um mm. the mark frost david lynch dynamic is actually probably a pretty good example of like that push and pull because yeah. mark frost episodes of twin peaks were like kind of way more traditional yeah. soap operas versus david lynch like i can't believe they're letting me do this on primetime television <laughs> yeah. let's go crazy kind of aspect to it yeah and i, I don't necessarily think it's like a direct translations but yeah. i like that's the thing that i am excited about the most mm-hmm. because the the thing that really caught my attention playing dark souls for the first time and just like in regards to the lore like removing talk about mechanics and things like that but like 
these stories felt like it was a history with, and this is a very cliched <laughs> metaphor, I know, but it felt like a history with the pages cut out. Yeah. So I'm reading through this and I'm, and as you're going online and you're talking to people and you're realizing my favorite example ever was figuring out like, oh, like there's a reason that Tarkus's armor is right here, mm-hmm. right? Because he got, he got here, like he was doing the same thing I was doing. That was a huge moment for me of just going like, oh, if I, I can pick up the clues, like this mm-hmm. is, this is, I can, I can figure this shit out. Uh, having that same thing that Miyazaki has talked about came from not quite understanding like Western fairy tales and Western fantasy, uh, but translated via George R. R. Martin of like, who has a really detailed understanding of fantasy, but could be completely different from Mm -hmm. their normal pulls. Right. Like, you know, there's not the concept of like four different kinds of giants in George (laughs) R. R. Martin's game of Thrones. Right. (laughs) Like we don't have that. So like, maybe we could do something different now. Um, I, I, that that is the thing that excites me. Like that's what I get excited mm-hmm. about. I realize I, I made it kind of an offhand comment about like saying like the leaked footage looks like Dark Souls Four, um, and and you're absolutely right. It could be a couple of years ago. It could be a year ago. We we have no idea. COVID has thrown so much into a yeah. in game development, especially in Japan, and just throw like such a just a disarray that we have no idea where that any of that footage is from. I just I can't tell you, I was watching this on my phone, like constantly refreshing the Lore Hunters Discord, <laughs> constantly refreshing my own Discord server, <laughs> trying to find links on Reddit and like watching yeah. this. And I saw Homing Soul Mass pop up and I'm like, are you really? Yeah. Are we okay? Cool. Yeah. Is it all right? All right. So it's okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> like it was just such a shock to see, right? Like it was yeah. such a surprise. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's interesting. And so like having pulled from there and like seeing from like a mechanical perspective, that like who knows could be placeholders could not be it's the tip of the iceberg we've seen gameplay that could extend far beyond this but like um what what would be your preference or like what what do you sort of hope mechanically that this might feel like because um it's always just interesting because i like for me personally dark souls one feels good to me i like the balance of dark souls one i like how poise works in dark souls one but i think that Mm -hmm. then also like Dark Souls 2 has a lot of cool RPG mechanics. And then Dark Souls 3, I don't like how roll spammy it feels. And poise there isn't my preference. I don't really like that system is a little bit convoluted to me. But what would you, what is sort of your hope for maybe how that, how it will feel mechanically? Like what would be like your best case scenario? And what would be like, uh, you know, what would be something that you would kind of hope doesn't make its way in based off of the series? So it's it's interesting charting the evolution of the series over the last 11 years or so, right? Yeah. Like coming from Demon Souls, um going to Dark Souls 1, which I think is even slower than Demon Souls. Like I feel like they slowed down the pace of the combat and the, the yeah. pace of the exploration. Um with the advent of Bloodborne, you know, that speeding that way way back up again, right? All of a sudden we're, you know, parry and they wanted to use the regain mechanic as opposed to using shields. They want to get they want you to be aggressive. And then go into Dark Souls 3, which you said roll spammy and I kind of like that. I kind of like that phrase of just feeling much more like if there's a if there's a line between I don't know, Dark Souls 1 and Devil May Cry, right? Like mm-hmm. Dark Souls 3 <laughs> is, is probably closer to is in the middle of there somewhere in a way that I don't particularly I like, I think it's very fun to play, but my favorite bits of Souls games are always the exploration part, are always that sense of trepidation as you were rounding a corner of a dark castle or whatever with your shield up, dreading, you know, skeletons or weird mantis creatures or is why is there a moving tree? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. those kind of weird moments are what I cherish the most. That's why I like to go into these as blind as possible. Like, I... I feel like once we get to a sizzle reel of footage, like I'm seeing every single area that the game has to offer and I don't want to see that. Yeah. So to me, I, I want that slower pace. Uh, I want that that sense of foreboding and drama. I want that sense of fear that, for the game to give me where I'm sitting on my couch and it's probably like, because I'm an old man now. Like, <laughs> like I play video games at like in the Saturday mornings because I don't have kids. But like, <laughs> I'm, it's 10 a.m. The sun is shining, but I'm I've got all the blinds closed. And I'm holding R1 to or L1 to hold my shield up as I'm going around a corner because I'm just terrified and I'm looking for a bonfire, whatever the equivalent of that is. That's the experience that I want the game to distill down for me. I feel like Dark Souls Three was missing that. Bloodborne 
had a bunch of that. Uh, Bloodborne was definitely terrifying, um, but it wasn't. Bloodborne was so fast paced that it didn't quite. It wasn't quite what I was looking for. It was much more mm-hmm. what I was looking for was Dark Souls One, which was you know that that kind of slower going through the depths. I'm gonna kind of walk in, as opposed to run kind of situation. I also, I feel like if this is their biggest game ever, this is their open world RPG uh, kind of thing. Like what I really am looking for is not just those like dark cavernous places. Mm-hmm. I want to see them do that same level of fear in like bl- with a blue sky, right? Yeah. Um, what's the what's the Dark Souls three area with the dragon that you do the hoppa and uh, hoppy stabby? The, the uh, Arch Dragon Peak. Yeah, like that area is beautiful. Yeah, but it's not it's not scary, right? Yeah. So I want to see like <laughs> that. I want to see them play with that, those kind of differences, the push and pull of that. Um, yeah. Mechanically wise, like I'm, I'm pretty easily satisfied. Like, give me some swords, give me some magic. I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. Stats are okay. Whatever. Like, skill tree, eh, not, not as much. Like, I don't really, I don't think they've ever really done skill tree stuff, so I, I doubt that will even happen. But I, I kind of have a feeling we're gonna get another adaptation of the classic Dark Souls <laughs> skill tree, yeah. Demon Souls skill tree, right? Or, or even. Cause I, cause I know the Omni's listening. So I'll even say like, even back to Kingsfield, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Jesus Christ, shadow, whatever shadow tower. Um, yeah, I, I, I so I, I feel like we're going to get another one of those, which is fine. Like a, yeah. just another version of that. I, but for my part, like in terms of mechanics, I want that super, super scary. I, I don't know what's happening. Everything is weird kind of yeah. feeling when I first play through it. How did you feel about, um, Sekiro with the stealth system like not the bosses so much but being out in the world because we've seen and we've heard rumors that and it seems to be confirmed at least by this footage for the time being is that it will have sort of like a Sekiro type light stealth system Uh, I'm okay I mean sure I I didn't find I found this stuff in Sekiro to be fun Mm. I didn't find it particularly challenging like uh, moving through the individual levels um, th- it seemed to be weighed heavily in, in favor of the player. Yeah. So it was pretty easy. Like the, the eyesights or whatever, which is fine. Cause like, look, I, when I play a stealth game nowadays, like I can't, <laughs> I get so stressed out. I was playing I- alien isolation the other day. And it, <laughs> as much as I love the alien franchise, I can't, like, it's yeah. just too stressful. I can't, I can't hang. Yeah. Um, so I like that, but I found it relatively easy as long as it's like fun and not, I have to quit the game because like this challenge is so difficult. I'm, I'm, fine with with stealth stuff and and look sneaking around uh in Sekiro was super fun right yeah. like just sneaking up on dudes tapping that r1 button doing the one shot <laughs> execution that was yep. fun as hell yeah it'll be interesting to see that in context of an rpg assuming that mechanic makes it through because i'm assuming that will play into stats and armor weight and stuff and other considerations that you didn't have in Sekiro. and i bring that up because you know, you're talking about that tension that I also really love. And I think that's part of, I don't think it's so much like the stamina consumption and stuff in Dark Souls 1, but it's just that slower pace of combat does inform level design in a way that I think you and I both vibe with a little bit more than Dark Souls 3, for instance, where it's a little bit more frenetic and fast paced. And in in here, it seems like with an open world, the open world bits I'm assuming that might feel more like Sekiro where you're getting to approach a situation sort of from your perspective. And I can't think of too many open world games that give that feeling of like, you could sort of have that feeling of dread around every corner, but because it's open, it's not, they're not authoring the way you move through that. However, it seems likely that a lot of these large castles and stuff that we're seeing are probably your like more classic souls dungeons that Miyazaki talked about. So it seems like there might be a blend of that more classic Souls experience. And then I'll be interested to see how they, you know, get that Souls feeling you're talking about in an open world. Now they could do that by having like a fucking dragon drop out of the sky or something, you know, that'll, that'll certainly get me. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think that, I don't think that that's possible from software would never t- drop a dragon out of the sky. <laughs> it make my horse giddy up a little bit right away. Trying to, it, it'll be super interesting. Cause you know, another thing is the horse, like how do you know that that's so it's it's hard for me to conceive of a souls game with something as fast as a horse 
And that's just like Sekiro was totally different with the grappling hook. But the idea of trying to fit souls into a game where you can move fast is like interesting to me. I don't quite know. Like it's hard even after seeing the leaked footage to really understand what it'll feel like moving through the open world. Cause I don't understand how you do the souls thing in an open world. Like what sort of density of encounters do you have? Like, what am I doing? I'm not getting side quests. Probably. I'm not like going to go kill 10 of these things and report back to one of a dozen quest givers in a town. Like it's just so interesting because yeah. I can't quite conceive of it. And I've spent far too much time thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's, it's, you know, on the stealth thing, it's real easy to get into a Assassin's Creed situation. And I've, I played, I like, I started playing Assassin's Creed with the first game. I've, I've mm-hmm. finally just got eventually like, okay, I'm, I'm over. I have done all of the assassins, assassinated and the Creedian that I need to do in my lifetime. <laughs> but uh, you know, they they would just kind of spawn you into these, for lack of a better word, instances, these individual missions where you had to like stalk people and they had specific rule sets and things like that. It's really easy to get into that trap. Where like now I took three steps out of where the game developer wanted wanted me to take, and I have to restart it from the checkpoint, which mm-hmm. sucks. That's that's not what you ever want to see in these games. Like I would much rather fail and die and restart from you know whatever the, my bonfire equivalent is. Mm-hmm. But on the other side of that, like when you start talking about stealth and like mechanics, you could like easily end up at Hitman Three, right, mm-hmm. or the Hitman series, where you're you are given this 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 box, and there's basically like there's some authorship of the levels, but they really want you to play within those environments. So to me, I think what we have to ask is like, what is from software's interpretation of an open world RPG? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think for a minute that we're going to have waypoints. We're not going to have yellow exclamation marks. We're not going to have uh, like a, I don't even think we, we might not even have a quest system as we are yeah. used to it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like I think that we're going to give be given like vague directions and kind of, mm-hmm told to explore a world and we're going to talk to NPCs and it's going to be, if it, it, my hope is it's going to be just as inscrutable as dark souls is yeah. right now, <laughs> which is like, Oh, I talked to a person. He killed six people in my hometown. I have no idea why. And now <laughs> I'm having yeah. a bad time of it. Like I want those kind of stories. Like yeah. that's, that's the kind of thing that I want. So yeah, when we start talking about like moving through the world, especially on like the back of a horse. I get kind of interested in that. Like, are, are we like think about like Dragon Quest? Uh, I think Eleven is the newest one. Mm, yeah, um, where you're like you get to the edge of a town and it's like, oh, do you want to ride your horse? Okay, <laughs> and you just, like hit the button and you're on a horse. Like it feels so gamey, right? Yeah, I can't imagine them doing something like that. So the idea that you would only, I don't know, man. Like imagine if it was The Witcher where you call, you can whistle any time and a horse mm-hmm. pops up. Like wouldn't that kind of take you out of? the game a little bit if that happened yeah it's 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 hard to imagine that's why i keep wondering like if this is like a like it seems easy enough to imagine that they're like castles are going to be set up where you have to dismount your horse because the horse can't physically get into the castle and then it obviously just stays there but yeah when you're out in the open world it's like is this an actual living horse are they going to try to like i'm so curious how from is going to do the thing where they take mechanics that are gamey and then they make them into the lore to make the artificiality feel grounded. And if they're going to be like, Oh, it's like some spirit horse that you like summon to you. But even that feels like weird in like the day night cycle. Like, yeah. are they going to gamify that? Or like, they're going to be like, Oh, day and night's broken because reality's broken because that's kind of what we do with our games. But it, it does feel it's hard to, that's why when people say like, oh, this looks just like Dark Souls 4, I'm like, but will it be though? Like, cause there's so many things that fly in the face of Dark Souls as I understand it. And I just don't know how they resolve those things. And I think that's where the game will either stand up or fall down mechanically is like how they interpret those things. Like you're saying, like, how, how do they do that? And uh, when I had uh, Dan Tack on the editor for Game Informer, he was sort of saying, you know, if he's imagining an open world, it's probably a similar, like there's these four dudes out there. You got to go kill them because that's the only yeah. thing we do. There's in four this- lands. <laughs> you have to unite the lands and bring yeah. the souls back to the land, to the yeah. tower so that you can fight the, the princess. It's going to turn out to be super hot and everyone's going to have a crush on her. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, but it's so interesting because when you, 
do that in a Souls game, you're following a certain path. And it's just like, maybe I'm overthinking it, but it's just so like, is it like Breath of the Wild where there's these big open like camps? But like, it's just, it's, it's hard for me to conceive of Souls in that way. And I think that's, that's why when people like say like, I, I do agree that the leaked trailer looks like Dark Souls, but it's like, it's, it's so much about context. And I don't, and I think while they showed scale off in the leaked trailer, there's still that context of like, I think, I think if I was in a position where I would go like dark on this game, I think the thing I'd want to see before just like quitting out of like learning anything is just like 10 minutes of straight gameplay. I just need to like yep. have some taste and then I'd be like, well, I'm good now. Like, I don't want to know anymore. Like, it's totally fine. Uh, I of course that won't do that. But. Exactly where I, where I'm going to end. Like that <laughs> yeah. that's it's gonna there's gonna be like the first ten minutes of Elden Ring, and I'm gonna like break and watch that. Yeah. And just so I can yeah. see the UI, see how it plays, get a feel yeah. for it, and then I'll I'll go on blackout because yeah. like Breath of the Wild is a great example. Like that's that's a game that you could conceivably play without talking to any NPCs. Well, maybe not any NPCs, but without really interacting or allowing the game to tell you anything like you can you can really make that game super immersive if you wanted to mm -hmm. um and that's what i would that's what i want i want that immersion from from the souls game yeah. but at the same time one of my highlights for my playthrough of breath of the wild was going through and looking at the map seeing that line that followed me everywhere i went and mm -hmm. realizing i there's a mountain over there i haven't explored and going to explore that mountain and is that from software's like interpretation of what an open world RPG is? Yeah. Because like I think for a lot of us, like open world RPG has been I don't know, it's it's like Ubisoft, right? Like I yeah. think that's where a lot of people's <laughs> brains go. And I just yeah. I, that feels so antithetical to anything that from software mm -hmm. has really done. I I just can't imagine it, right? Like I just yeah. like going back to the PS2 and PS1 days, like yeah. go at, go to Evergrace or to Eternal <laughs> Ring or whatever. Like none of that stuff looks looks like anything that it was out at the time. Like it's yeah. always been something different. So yeah, when I see leaked footage of what looks like you know quote unquote Dark Souls Four, to me that just informs like hey this is what that game looks like like mm. a year or two ago. I can't like extrapolate that to make any judgments on the game at all. Because no. it's it's just not there yet. Like I need, like you said, we need the context for all that stuff there. I need to see the UI. Like yeah. give me the UI, and also let me know if I can hide it. Like that's going to be two very important things. <laughs> yeah. Like will will they bring back the dynamic UI? I think that is at least in Dark Souls yeah. Three, and I love that. That's that's oh the way, that's that's one it, contribution I really like from Dark Souls Three. I think it is. So give me a photo mode from. That's Ooh. all I'm looking for in your games is a photo mode. <laughs> I know after after playing through Demon Souls the remake i'm like ooh, photo mode is a lot of fun and of course that game you know it's it's funny um seeing comments for lee trailer like some people are like man this doesn't look at all as good as the demon souls remake and one thing i'm like is well this footage is horrible but also like there's no way in hell elden ring was ever going to be on par with the demon souls remake because like that was the point i think of the demon souls remake to some degree was to look super pretty and to sell the ps5 as a piece of hardware so it's like but but they've always from has always personally made up with it with like art direction and stuff because i can think of very few games that have struck me visually like the first time i saw Irithil or the first time i saw hemocternal lane or like my go-tos just as like these places where i was like oh shit like that looks really nice and like it's just purely an aesthetic reaction it's not so much a graphics reaction absolutely like we've put up with like from software games not running great for years like mm -hmm. i was invading in upper blight town in 2012 right like i know about bad frame rate <laughs> <laughs> like i can handle that shit i just i and I, I and i keep coming back to it like that's such an important part is that aesthetic that yeah wowing yeah. you with the picturesque scenes wowing you with those point of views and i i just i don't know breath of the wild was so good with that it was so considered mm -hmm. about how it positioned things in the world from software has a history of like really amazing level design. Did you see mm -hmm. illusory walls tweet thread today about the opening of demon souls? I did. Way? Yeah. Yeah. I read through that. I, I consume everything that guy puts up because oh, yeah, absolutely. He, yeah. He's, he's, he's so smart. But just <laughs> finding out that like even back in demon souls, they were trying to mm -hmm. inter interleave those worlds on top of each other. Yeah. I, I get, I get so excited when I think about them taking that to a huge scale in Elden ring. I, yeah. And again, like I, you can't compare that to Demon Souls, the remake at mm. all. Like that's not what that game is is for. Like that game was to be a PS a, a game that sold PS5s. And it yep. does a good job at that. And it's a great game all mm. on its own.
Yeah. But that's not the re- like the reason it existed was to look at extremely polished and great. And that's not yeah. what From Software is out to make with Elden Ring, I don't think. Yeah, and I think, you know, as much as some people may want the technical like fidelity after seeing Demon Souls, I think the majority of uh Souls fans are a little bit like, eh, I want it to be a little janky, a little weird, because <laughs> that's exactly like there's almost like I like I like Dark Souls three and I replayed it in the last year and I liked it a lot more than back in 2017 or 2016 when I was first playing it. But like it is, it, there is also almost a part of it where I'm like, this game is pretty polished. I could do with like a half measure, less polish and a little more like <laughs> make the covenants weird because the, like, yeah, there's just like, it doesn't, it doesn't benefit my experience from, from, I don't want all mechanics. I want, I'm more interested in them like doing something weird than doing something that always makes sense. And I'm, and I'm not sure exactly what we'll get in Elden Ring. I don't think they'll get too crazy with that sense, but this may be the game to really have the world design shine because I think that's where they're going to be focusing most of their effort. And um, oh, what what was it that was brought up? It's, it's interesting to me that you mentioned, like when we think of open world games, there's such a thought in my head of what an open world game looks like because it's such a popular genre and it's been so thoroughly explored that like when ghost of Tsushima came out, like, and I tend to agree is like, it's a really good open world game, but it's certainly an open world game. That is the sum of like a decade of experience of games coming out and doing a certain thing. And I think ghost of Tsushima has some interesting touches that make it a little bit better than that. I, I really like that game, but um, it's still very much, an open world game and we haven't seen from software move into a space like this where they're tackling a genre that we think we know really well, except for like, because even when I started playing dark souls back in 2011, it was like, Oh, this reminds me a lot of like old school, like Metroid and Castlevania, which I remembered from my childhood, Mm -hmm. but not those games because they were 2d. So it was even different. This is the first time I can really recall that from software is tackling such an established genre. They're still coming like 10 years too late as tends to be like their, their thing. But yeah, that has me excited honestly, because I just don't know if they're capable of making something bland. And I like, I just, I just feel like, you know, it's, that's not even a shot against them. I just, I think that they're so entrenched in what they do. So it's so strange to see them tackle something that sounds so mainstream on one hand. <laughs> Absolutely. And like, and again, like I'll go back to it. Like what, what do they, what do the developers, what does Miyazaki, what does his design partners, what if it, what do his level designers think of when they say open world RPG? Like, are they picturing fucking Tom Clancy's whatever? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, or Assassin's Creed or, days gone or Mm -hmm. you know know what i'm saying like are they picturing (laughs) those like very stereotypical modern open world rpgs or like are they thinking like we want to do dark souls but like where you could go anywhere at the very beginning of the game like we want it to be we want it like is it something is it one of those situations that you get sometimes where they have to call it something Mm, and so they say open world rpg but what they're actually like thinking in their head is something totally different but that's the best way that they could verbalize it like i wonder and i would be super excited about this by the way like it may it would go so far as maybe to like have me start don't give up skeleton up again so i can talk to people about (laughs) it every weekend like i used to but um if like Elden Ring comes out and the conversation around it is what genre is this? Yeah. Wouldn't that be the most exciting thing that it could happen? Like what, <laughs> like what, how do we even talk about this game is the conversation I want to have not, mm-hmm. Oh, it's a shame that it doesn't do X or Y or Z. Right. Like yeah. I just want it to be so weird. I want it to be filled with vagrants that I don't understand until mm-hmm. illusory wall spends a decade of his life explaining them on <laughs> Wikipedia is like, I want covenants that do weird shit to my NPCs. I want, yep a system that allows me to, you know, mess up the game world and replay mm-hmm. it if I need to, like in another, in another game. Like I want all of that weird stuff to happen. Cause I think that's what from excels at. like all of that weird stuff is so good. Like yeah. all of the stuff that I like from across the games outside of PVP, I guess, which feels like a weird one off in, in and of itself that they even do that kind of stuff. But yeah. like, <laughs> it's always the weird stuff. Like it's always going into a situation and thinking like, I don't know 
none of this resonates with me as familiar at all. And mm-hmm. I love that. Uh, I just played, there's a game called uh, Anodyne. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, and I just played the first one. It's available on basically everything for dirt cheap. Like, hmm. go play it. It's just a weird, like, top-down Zelda game. Okay. Um, but it's full of, like, surrealism and strange hmm. things happening. and. Yeah weird NPCs that tell you strange, interesting things. And like, you're just kind of fascinated by it. And one of my earliest video game memories is playing the first Zelda on NES or seeing my cousin play that game and just being taken into it. But like, Oh my God, what is this? You can just walk around. What is this? Like, I've never seen a game (laughs) like this before. All I've played is Pong. I, and I feel like from software has the potential Elden Ring to like build those experiences. Yeah. I'm, I'm, and I know I'm ranting. I'm sorry. You guys are getting one beer, J right now. So I apologize that I'm just <laughs> ranting YouTube commenters. <laughs> you can tell me in the comments if you hate all this stuff. But I, I, I get kind of... This, see, Sean, this is what you do. This You make hype happen with this. And I don't like this. I don't like this feeling about getting excited because they're just... I'm, what if I'm let down? Like, I'm... <laughs> I don't you know, let down at this point in my life. Yeah, I, I don't know if I brought it up. I know it was cut out of the Illusory Wall episode... But that has been a consistent feedback is I have people on who are like, you know, in- excited about Elden Ring, long time from software fans, but they haven't, you know, it's crazy to keep up with Elden Ring like I have. I don't know why I've done it. I don't know why anyone else would do it. And then they come on and we talk and um, I-, I just, I set loose the hype because I think that's the thing that is you start thinking about Elden Ring and that's what I've been attached to for so long is like, Sekiro was a very good game that I don't feel compelled to replay very often, if ever. And I think there is just this huge excitement at the idea of a a new Dark Souls game <laughs> that we have not had. Like, we had two and three, but this is a new world. There's greater. There's the greatest potential for, like, since Bloodborne of being a Souls game, essentially but even more dark souls because it's a, it's like a dark fantasy action role-playing game and it's leaning supposedly into the RPG elements. And it's just like, that really hits some core memories with dark souls. As we are saying, like those, those first experiences and just like takes me way back. And I think that's part of the excitement about it. Is it, and it, it could be the thing that brings it crashing down is it has such potential and it's, it's, when we've waited so long and so little is known about it. And then these leaks come out and they don't really tell us anything, but they act as like a Rorschach test almost for like, what are you, what are you picking out of these leaks? What's interesting to you? What's disappointing. And it's just that I think that's where the hype comes from is it's really people who are invested in from software as a developer. Like this is the first time in a long time they're really doing something super fresh even Sekiro is like based off of Tenshu and it's sort of part of an established thing but this is like new this is a new world this is for me this is new lore talking about new lands we haven't had a place that was wholly a blank canvas talking about new fantasy worlds and getting to experience stuff like sound sorcerers and like weird stuff like that. We haven't experienced that since like dark souls one because dark souls two and three had to deal with the fact that they were taking place in a world that was connected Mm -hmm. to dark souls. And I don't know, they both chose very different ways to do it. And neither one was as exciting to me as just having that new world. And then bloodborne is a more contained story. It's a smaller story it's a little bit more straightforward in its outline, but this is, this is who knows what. And I think that's, what's exciting about it is it's, 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 it's mysterious again, make from software mysterious. I have, yeah. Make, <laughs> yeah. Put that on your hats. <laughs> you weirdos. Um, I, have, I have a comment and I have a question for you. Sure. My, my comment is that uh, when I, we've looked for me, Having talked to like 200 some odd people for Don't Give Up Skeleton, when we mm-hmm. talk about from software games, the overwhelming majority, even if they prefer Dark Souls 2 and if, even if they love to build up some Dark Souls 3 or whatever, like people will tell you that there, the actual trilogy like is Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Bloodborne. Yep. Like that's the three. 
Yeah. Right. And and you can take that like I think some of the the retro purists are like you know, hey, Kingsfield, Shadow Tower, all that stuff. Yeah. But like <laughs> I think there's a huge population that started with these games that view those three as the trilogy. I quit I didn't say quit, but I we stopped I stopped recording Don't Give Up Skeleton right around the time Sekiro came out mm-hmm. for a reason. Um I don't think that that fits into that pantheon of games. Like I think it's an evolution of a different along a different path yeah. with some of those same like kind of tendrils connecting back to the soul series this elden ring like the way they've talked about it the stuff that they have shown the stuff that they have not actually <laughs> shown on purpose makes me think that this is like the fourth pillar for that right mm-hmm. like this is the fourth pillar from them going back to the fantasy world which i think me and you both agree like it's our it's a huge attraction for us like yeah. i love bloodborne don't get me wrong i love that stuff but like swords and boards are where i'm at i love mm-hmm. that that having like this really to me feels like the fourth pillar of of what from software can do and i'm the potential for that is so insane that up until literally probably like 10 minutes ago in this podcast i have been managing to contain my hype into a very <laughs> small place where i could just like be on my weird discord servers that have less than 200 people in them and like watch the leaked footage and talk about it um but really not been super excited because we just didn't know anything about it mm-hmm. uh and but if you kind of sit back and you think about it, you're like, oh, damn, it's from software and it's George R. R. Martin and it, it, <laughs> yeah. all this stuff. Like, and this leads into my question, which is, and I apologize if you've answered this before uh, in previous episodes. You do this every day, so I, I can't keep up with that kind of output, man. You got to <laughs> got to take it down to weekly. Come on. Um, how dangerous do you think that thought process is? Like, how dangerous do you think it is for? To to even if you're trying actively trying not to build it up in your in your head, it's really hard not to put that stuff on a pedestal mm-hmm. and to come at it. I did this with the Demon Souls remake. I was talking about this on um with uh, Zach Sharp from Lord Jane and Beyond. Uh, I, with the Demon Souls remake, I was so excited for it when it came out. I was like, oh, it's just the video game. <laughs> like it's not the second coming of Christ. Like it's not. Yeah. It's not the thing to take my depression from COVID away or anything like that. Like it's just the video game. And the video game is fine. I know one day I will go back to that video game and have a lot of fun with it, but it wasn't what my head made it out to be. How worried are you about the whiplash, both in yourself, but also like our Twitter is going to be a nightmare for probably like what a month, right? Well, <laughs> it's going to be take after lucky. take after take. Like, it's going to be bad. <laughs> yeah, that that is a good question. That's been something that, like, the reason I do the Elden Ring so far videos, which I should have one coming up any day now it's surprisingly it's hard to do videos every day and also edit a big video um but that's been something that's why i do follow these games so closely and why i spoil myself in some ways is because for me i'm super interested in trying to as best i can understand exactly where from software is coming from when they release their game that's why i eat up all the interviews all the images I'm trying to absorb the angle upon which I'm supposed to experience the game, the, the, what they were trying to bring to the table instead of maybe my own wants and wishes. And cause I think it could be very dangerous. And I think the community as a whole, we've seen just a small taste of that with the leaked trailer, because there's like, if you visit, if you visit the Elden Ring subreddit, which is dangerous to do, um, there's a lot of hype and I think it it is that potential, but when people talk about Elden Ring could be there, like I've heard the term magnum opus thrown around quite a few times. There's people who (laughs) believe like, like, like you're saying like this could be in that like Holy Pantheon. I'm the same way. Dark souls, demon souls, bloodborne. That's my trio. And I have a hard time imagining Elden Ring coming in and butting any of those out. If, if, or, you know, putting any of them on the back burner and um, it is it is tough because there's so much potential there. But at the end of the day, it will be a game <laughs> and it will be confined within its the limits of what they're trying to do. And I think with the leak trailer, you see people being a little disappointed about, oh, this is Dark Souls again. And it, I think it is speaking toward the idea that like everyone wants something different. And I think there is a bit of people looking at Elden Ring as potentially the optimal souls game or the optimal from game, because I've seen a lot of people really disparaging the idea of them not 
heavily using Sekiro mechanics, which it almost certainly won't. And um, besides maybe stealth, but it's not going to be like a deflect system or something. But everyone is sort of bringing their own collection of wants and desires to this game. And for me, I've been intently following and sort of managing my own hype because I'm obviously susceptible to it is switching the conversation from being about like, what could Elden Ring do for me? And more so like, Oh, what are from software exploring as artists, as developers? And what is this, what is this, what are they getting into? How is this helping them grow? What is this passion that they're bringing to it that they haven't been able to put it into other projects? And from that end, I had people ask me before, like, what if Elden Ring is a big disappointment to you? Or what if it's not a good game? And for me, at least as like someone who creates content, that's discussion, baby. Like, you know, like I, I can make something <laughs> off of that and um, that'll be fun. But I am. I, I have a hot take on that, by the sure. way, like, which is if Elden Ring comes out, I, it is, let's just say like objectively, there is no objectively bad video game, right? Like everybody has entitled their opinion. People can like video games that aren't good mechanically or don't have X, Y, or Z, whatever, whatever, whatever. If From Software releases Elden Ring and it just flops, it doesn't resonate with any of the Souls fans. Critics hate it. Art people hate it. It's going to take ten years for the vibe for the zeitgeist <laughs> to turn around on it. All this thing, I would actually like let go of my inner disappointment that you know From Software made a bad video game and just breathe a sigh of fucking relief. <laughs> finally, like <laughs> finally, yeah, like cause, because like at a certain point, like you can't live up to the hype. Yeah. Like, I, I don't have a good musical reference to this, but, okay, Guns N' Roses, because I grew up with fucking Guns N' Roses. <laughs> Let's do this. Like, right? Like, Use Your Illusions 1 or 2, Follow an Appetite for Destruction. Like, they were, like, now we're looking at from software's Chinese democracy. I'm sorry, everybody, I said that. <laughs> I'm really, really sorry. But what if it comes out and it's just, like, what if it's not even remarkably bad? What if it's just so incredibly average? And then like, yeah. okay, we can breathe a sigh of relief and maybe it gives them the opportunity to like just make a video game again without this mm. like pressure cooker situation. I'm so yeah. sorry. I said from software Chinese <laughs> democracy. Oh my God. <laughs> curse. Curse. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, yeah, it's, there's a bit of that, the, the uh, breaking bad, like, gif i'll use for a reaction or i think you say jeff you're one of those people um um <laughs> it's the <laughs> it's the uh, he can't keep getting away with this thing like if if elden ring ends up being a super big hit and everybody loves it it is kind of, there is a little bit of that it is like man like that all you know then i think i think you're right that like how can they keep trending upward and i think for for a lot of people who sort of anchor themselves to preferring Dark Souls 1, there's been a push towards difficulty and stuff that has been unfavorable for people like myself. Oh, who don't, I don't want the yeah. games to get harder. I think Sekiro overstepped its limits at points for me. It was a little bit beyond what I preferred in its difficulty, at least at first blush. And um, so there, that's one axis on which a large portion of the community will probably be happy. Like I I'm in, I'm in a discord server with um, some people and a lot of them prefer dark souls three over dark souls one. And that they like the polish and the difficulty. Cause that's just where that lies for them. And um, it's a mixture of people who came into the series later and a mixture of people who started with like demon souls or dark souls. So it is, it isn't consistent with any one experience, but there's plenty of people, you know, sort of outside of our general community, a large portion of the population really thinks Dark Souls 3 was it, you know, like from a mechanics and a polish standpoint, that was appealing. And uh, I think that's one vector where part of the community could not be into it and the other part could love it. And then that puts it in sort of that zone you're talking about where it's like more of the same. So it would be interesting to see it have a really strong reaction in either direction. And, you know, I, I, I wouldn't... I don't want them to make a Chinese democracy, <laughs> but, but it would be really interesting. <laughs> I have never, you talk about that, like people viewing games differently. I, um, I had a, my job involves talking to people. I'm in sales. So I talk to people all the time. Um, 
I, I have to ingratiate myself with them. So, you know, chat them up, talk about stuff. And I was mm-hmm. riding around with this guy one day and uh, you could just tell he had video game written all over him, right? Like, yeah. I forget the character, but he was wearing like a Smash Brothers hat or something. Like, he had video game all over him. Um, so we get to talk about video games. I'm like, what do you like? He's like, what do you what, what do you like? And I'm like, well, have you ever played, you know, Dark Souls? Like, just throwing it out there. Because mostly, most people do not pick this up at all. And he goes, oh my God, I absolutely mm. love Dark Souls 3. Mm. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, let's, let's get into why. Like, at the time, I was still doing Don't Give Up Skeletons, so I'm excited to talk about this stuff. And um, he proceeds to tell me how him and his two friends get together every single night with the goal of just smashing through the game. Uh, they spend uh, like hours every night grinding to max out their level, like literally 99 the stats in the game, right? Like <laughs> max out their level so they can just go through and smash everything and use every single weapon. And I'm thinking like, I've never met a person more different than me in my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> and it's so strange when you, when you encounter folks like that, like, and you have to open your mind to accept that. And you know, I watched streamers. I got real big into Mario Maker uh, streamers this past couple of years, and those dudes love Dark Souls Three. Uh, yeah. Like one in particular, I'm thinking of, like for that reason of like it's a challenge, and I love mm-hmm. the build system, and I like how fast it is, and it really makes you step back and realize, like, and, and I, I don't want to sound like a, a hipster, like ooh, I liked Radiohead before Kid A or whatever. I don't, know, I don't know their big album, but like, <laughs> I don't want to sound like a hipster, but like you think about like Demon Souls and like the weird import cult status that it had mm-hmm. versus Dark Souls 3 which has sold what like 5 or 10 million copies at this point like it's yep. insanity and you realize like oh this thing that I like that has always been for me and my cool friends to hang out and talk with is actually part of something much bigger and like it's not necessarily going to it may not resonate with me like they mm. from software could easily chase that 10 million right like they could chase that hard difficulty curve they could chase yep. the Sekiro boss fights and they could be what they're planning because that's what's sold that's yeah. what bando nemkai has advertised it for yeah. and all this other stuff like it could be they they could be leaving me behind and like mm-hmm. you said like for yourself as somebody who you know creates content around this stuff like that would be an interesting conversation that's discourse baby and you go after <laughs> it for me i would be like all right like who's the next right like yeah. trying to find um, this is something I always appreciated out of the twin humanities is trying to find those, the next demon souls, which mm-hmm. was for us a couple of years ago, like a mortal and chained, go check out a mortal and chained everybody. Like it's not perfect, but it's weirdly great in a way that I think mm-hmm. most souls fans would appreciate. Um, trying to chase that I think is also really, really worthwhile. If yeah. from software can't continue to deliver hit after hit. <laughs> after, yeah. Maybe I just want, I want from software's user illusions three. And maybe that's what I really <laughs> want. <in> this world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's anyway i'm rambling now i'm sorry i started rambling at some point in there so i apologize oh no yeah it's it's, it's some good points that it's like there is that difficulty ramp up and my general thought about it has been like as much as i like the games like they're not it's always been and it's been said by many people it's the sum of the parts versus the individual pieces like the combat isn't that technically interesting like it has enough verbs to do its thing but it's not like it's not nearly as in-depth as other systems and that's something i kind of appreciated about the games but as a result in order to keep it interesting for an increasingly competent user base they had to make the ai they had to make the enemies do different things to sort of anticipate what players were now abusing and figure out ways to punish that and they did that through you know 360 degree attacks and um weird cadences for their attack patterns and like things to throw players off and i my hope is that something about sekiro where i don't think sekiro is actually a super hard game when you play through it again but it's hard initially and i think part of that is that they were trying different things and i would prefer that they find new ways to challenge the player versus this arms race toward trying to keep up with the players who are increasingly competent at their games and just finding new ways to challenge them versus just making it harder. And the other thing that I've thought about that maybe is just something to come to terms with is like Miyazaki as a designer has tended to like faster games. Like he, like Dark Souls 2, for instance, is slow, is probably the slowest one of all. And that's because Yui Tanamura was heading that one up and he 
got started with games because he loved Kingsfield and Kingsfield is super slow. And it's just, it may be something where like, I love the stuff Miyazaki's done, but his preference, it may not even be that they're necessarily just trying to keep up, but that might be where the studio finds interest in some ways is finding new ways to challenge players as they get more competent at this system they've designed. So it's hard to say, but I, I would hope that they might just provide new things that you have to learn or become proficient at new systems to just add wrinkles instead of just keeping the same verbs and making harder enemies to counteract people being used to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I, I like, I can always appreciate what Sekiro did, which was teach you a different language. Like I remember very early on at the exact moment of that game where I realized I didn't have a stamina bar. But I was like, up to that point, I had been playing like I played yep. Dark Souls game, which is playing like it's like, oh, I'm gonna hit a couple of times and then back off, and then like, I think it was the ogre, and like going like, oh, I could just literally hold down the circle button and then just run all over this place, like no problems whatsoever. Like that's mm-hmm. what I should be doing. That's how I need to do this. And I, you know, I pr- I appreciate that, and I even like some of the boss challenges. Like I went through. And did Ishin on, you know, New Game 3 or whatever, just for funsies. Like, I think it took, like, four hours or something crazy, but I did it. And I, at the end of that, like, you... I guess good's probably not the great... It's not the right exact feeling I'm looking for, but, like, you feel like you have accomplished something, mm-hmm. maybe. <laughs> um, for me, personally, it felt like it was gratifying. Like, oh, I I did the thing that I had set out to do. Yeah. Uh, I, For me, I you could not have bosses in Elden Ring, and I would be fine. Right. Mm-hmm. Like if you gave me a bunch of areas to explore and some things to find and some, I don't know, weird dialogue to manage. I don't know. Like, like weird books to puzzles that I have to do. I don't know. Just, I just want to, I want it to go a little crazy sometimes. And mm-hmm. I would be completely fine if Elden Ring came out and was like, there was zero bosses in it. <laughs> that is that. I'm sure that is something most people will agree with. <laughs> <laughs> let us know in the comments everybody comment down below if you think jeremy greer is right about no bosses in elden ring i don't do youtube videos is that what you do you have to engage with your audience as yeah you talk, talk to them yeah I don't, like, I don't do this for you. yeah let, let me know in the comments how wrong jeremy is <laughs> yeah i think that's what i'm that's supposed fine. to do that's totally okay <laughs> um, you can find me at you can find me on twitter at gary b-u-h <laughs> gary <Ba. laughs> Okay, and with that, I think it is time to, uh, I think we've hyped ourselves up enough where we can uh, watch this beautiful leaked trailer and, uh, and, uh, I'm ready. Enjoy some Dark Souls 4. Yep, yep. Dragon falling down. (laughs) Love it. Those are the Dark Souls 2 giants, right? Like, we can all agree. With, with, Dark Souls 2 Giants. with different faces, but very similar. I love I love a giant face in the landscape too, man. That's that's that's, that's the good stuff right there. Yeah. These are just, just like guys you would find in the forest, right? Like, yeah. I'm in Dark Root right now. <laughs> Imagine what drives you to seek the Elden Ring. I suppose you can't be talked into turning back. Very well, then. That skeleton is just so bad looking. It is yeah, shocking. Absolutely. <laughs> it's so jarring. Yeah. I just couldn't believe we were seeing, like... I mean, that's the, that's the like, eight-armed dude, right? So that's yeah. obviously a boss fight. So my Elden Ring doesn't have bosses. is already wrong. But... <laughs> Perfect. This perfect transition. <laughs> it this is that's why I tend to watch the other trailer most days. Honestly, is because I I can't stand the jar of going through the the awesome pump up music to B roll landscape footage. We didn't talk about this, but uh, the the slow door opening animation. I'm very glad sees a return. Mm-hmm. I feel like that needs to be in every single from yeah. software game from now on. Um, yeah, they can't get rid of that because. Yeah. It'd be a crime, and uh, it doesn't look like they'll be getting rid of the uh, Moonlight Greatsword either, as we're about to see. Actually, I haven't. I don't know that I've seen this part. I've only seen the first part. Yeah, get ready for like, this. I don't, I, okay, well, I have not seen this. This who, whatever this situation is. Oh, dude, just that's straight up moon time right there, dude. Yeah, what, like, up, what up? You see the color of that moon? There's no way. 
<laughs> There's no way. Maybe you're going to pull a sword out of the moon and we're, I'm going to be hype about it. That's what's going to happen. And that is that is an interesting thing, especially if you haven't seen it, is like this final scene, like that looks like a, like a oh my God, I always pronounce this wrong in some of the comments, in the comments, uh, an, an onmyoji, like a, like a Japanese sorcerer. You know, like that person looks like much more Asian than anything else in the game. And it really gets me excited. Like, is there going to be like, is there going to be like some like cool Japanese architecture somewhere where we have like a Japanese looking fortress? Because if it's a big world with multiple kingdoms, like who's, who's to say like they could, they could easily bring in something else. And I think that could be pretty cool. Cause that's something that dark souls never, you know, you have like bit of chaos, but it's like limited in those like non-Western architectural touchstones. And it would be cool to just get that increased variety. And this is where I think, having someone like George R. R. Martin kind of build the politics of your land mm-hmm. can be really helpful. Cause like he did that so well in game of Thrones where yeah. the individual places felt like different places from a economical, from an economy standpoint, from a landscape for standpoint, from a, this is like, I, I always think, and I can never remember the names of it. So like, forgive me game of Thrones fans, but like the sand, the desert family or whatever, like had yeah. such a different vibe than anything else that had come before and because they were just culturally different. And I'd love to see that reflected in architecture and, and, and level design, right? Like that would get me more excited about it it, it, than anything else. Like just to see a wide variety of Mm -hmm. those things kind of happening in the game. Exactly. Just, yeah. Variety is my, my touchstone too. I just want some variety, like variety in builds, variety in ways to explore. I mean, hell, like I don't, I don't watch a whole lot of like, um, streamers and like let's plays but souls games i've always enjoyed watching like lobos and my in my, my buddies and a few other people like play through the games and like if i can watch uh a, a souls game where there's enemies moving around kind of randomly in the world and so i can actually watch like truly unique experiences in a souls context like that's that's really exciting yeah, we I talked about this with uh, Zach just recently, but thinking about how in Dark Souls One the Black Knights were supposed to be mm. roaming enemies, right? Like the having that in an open world situation is really really exciting just yeah. to see, because like that was my the reason I wanted to watch a bunch of people stream Dark Souls One was to get to those big like ah moments. But if mm-hmm. you had not just those like whoa moments, but you had that organically, like that the mm-hmm. game would just develop for you, or that you would have a hand in developing because your decisions or because of your actions inside the game. How cool would that be? Like every, mm-hmm. and again, like this is the danger of hype in my mind. Is like now <laughs> I believe that they are doing this. I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> Jeremy, they've released one trailer. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> they've, calm down. They've technically still <laughs> released just one trailer in two interviews. <laughs> So, it's crazy absolutely but, crazy yeah it's 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 been longer so if you were comparing this to like Sekiro from the first time we saw that teaser i don't know if you remember like people going crazy in those six months leading up to e3 and then like Do trying I? to figure out like what that was but like if you count Sekiro starting now like in that time where we've gotten no new information Sekiro would have already come out like it's just on such a different time frame like yeah. it, it's it's very interesting but that has been day 646 of watching an Elden Ring trailer and um Jeremy thank you so much for coming on today and just um getting you hyped talking about uh Chinese democracy and how you don't want bosses <laughs> in Dark Souls and um I- <laughs> <laughs> hot takes everybody that's what bring, that's what drives the youtube subs is hot takes <laughs> yeah but uh so where can people find you on the internet i think you only do like five or six podcasts now so yeah um <laughs> so the the best place is twitter at jg mm-hmm. career um follow me over there i post random bullshit about video games mostly um the i think this audience specifically would probably get a kick out of don't give up skeleton um, some of your previous guests have been on that podcast. It's yep. an interview based setup. So it's me interviewing somebody about their experiences with the souls games. It goes all over the place. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to interview like some, some of my favorite people. Uh, Danny O'Dwyer did an episode, which is really, mm. really good. He talks about being a dad and playing Bulletborn for the first time. I like to point people there. Yeah. Um, a lot, but all of the episodes are super fun and interesting. Uh, I'll do other podcasts. So if you like Supernatural, Monster of the Week is my Supernatural podcast. It's very funny and dumb, and we have a lot of fun with that. 
me and my friend Gary, who we mentioned is also a big souls guy from Bonfire Side Chat, do a podcast called Days of Future Cast. Um, we actually just wrapped up our um, run on ecstatics. We've talked mm-hmm. about comic books and Marvel, uh, mostly X Men stuff. Um, and we're about to start. We haven't announced it yet, but we're about to start like a whole new series, which I'm very excited about. So, nice. uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's it. Is that is that all of them? I think that's it. <laughs> I all think of so. The stuff that I do. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I'll have all those linked down in the description. It'll be a few paragraphs long, I think. Um, which oh, and if you're if you're on YouTube, right? Like, go to uh, what's my YouTube? It's not E C E C. I do. There's a ton of old, yeah. ancient ass Dark Souls videos. But like, if you've ever been like super curious about Karmic Justice, I was one of like two or three people on the internet mm. talking about Karmic Justice and Dark Souls <laughs> one, like in 2013. So. Yeah. Come check that out, everybody. So. Yeah, yeah, de- definitely recommend all of that. Check that out in the description below. I'll have all those linked up. And uh, once again, just thanks for joining me. I'm happy to get people hyped up. And who knows when we'll see a new trailer? You know, hopefully, you know, by 2023. I'm not sure. So you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens. But I'm I'm still Team April. I'm thinking I'm still following before when E3 would be which is a weird way to describe it, but that's the world we live in now. I don't know how else to describe. So you're setting time. yourself or failure, failure here. It's not, it's yeah. not going to happen, man. I get, it's just not going to happen. You know, if I've, I've put on the clown makeup plenty of times, as I've mentioned a few <laughs> times, I started Elden ring lore.com in 2019. I pay hosting on that fucking <laughs> website. So, uh, <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> so, oh, really uh, yeah. Funny. So, um, I, I am actively, I have to do this series so that my family can eat because I've spent all my money on hosting. So, um, this... somebody, somebody please help me with my budget. <laughs> <laughs> I've made so many Elden Ring websites. Please, my family's starving. But um, yeah, so thank you again for joining me. And uh, thank you uh, for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, everyone, uh, stay tuned tomorrow for day six forty seven. <laughs>